Welcome to another of METV's programs highlighting the legal profession. I'm Lee Hayworth. There are about 100,000 licensed attorneys in the state of Florida. Like many professions, doctors, psychologists, law enforcement officers, and teachers, they're held to a code of ethics. As we will see, the regulation of lawyers is different from other professions, and the public is generally not aware of many of the special rules that members of the legal profession have to follow. Today we're going to discuss what happens when an attorney is accused of crossing ethical lines, the process for complaint and investigation, and how allegations of misconduct are prosecuted and finalized. Understand that what happens when a complaint is made against an attorney, he or she is not looking at jail, but to potential loss or suspension of their license to earn a living practicing law. Now we've invited two participants in the process here to discuss how lawyers get in trouble, how clients or others aggrieved by misconduct can request an investigation, and the due process attorneys are provided when charged with an ethical lapse. We'll also discuss the possible pen penalties an attorney can face if found guilty of a violation. So let me introduce the panel. We'll start first with Sheila M. Tuma, Esquire. You are Chief Branch Discipline Counsel for the Florida Bar. Yes, um, I work in our Tampa branch and I um, run that branch and that's one of our five branches that we have. I worked for the bar for 17 years and before that I did this work in Illinois, the same type of work, investigating complaints for the Attorney Disciplinary Commission there. Great, thank you. We also have with us Scott Westheimer. Now Scott is the 12th Circuit Representative the Florida Bar Board of Governors and we'll explain about that in a few minutes what the Board of Governors is. So welcome Scott. Thank you, sir. I practice law here at Cypert Mishad uh, in Sarasota. I actually grew up in Sarasota. The, the 12th Circuit com is comprised of Manatee, Sarasota, and DeSoto County, and, and I'm the attorney that represents those three counties on the Board of Governors. All right. Let's get right into it. So, who regulates lawyers? Sheila, who, who's responsible for that? The regulation is done by the Supreme Court and the Florida Bar is an arm of the Supreme Court, so we do the regulation for the Supreme Court, but they make the final decision. All right, so does every lawyer have to be a member of the Florida Bar? Uh, every lawyer in the state of Florida, yes, must be a member of the Florida Bar. Okay, and so how does the, um, the regulation of attorneys differ from other professions, Scott? Uh, we, the Florida Bar, which is a branch of the Supreme Court, self-regulates, so we as attorneys regulate our own discipline. No taxpayer funds, no government funds are used. Bar dues are used to regulate attorneys. So we are not under the auspice of the Department of Business and Professional Regulation or other governmental entities. The Supreme Court and the Florida Bar regulate attorney's conduct. So how does a, a person who's going to be a lawyer learn about the ethical rules? What process is there to educate them so that when they take the bar and pass that, that they know what they can and cannot do. Sheila, how's that work? Well, when you're in law school, there's a professionalism class that you have to take. Um, be before you take the bar exam, you also have to take a separate course on professionalism and pass that. And once you're admitted to the bar, you're, you learn, you get a booklet of all the rules and you're obligated to know what those rules are and how to follow them. After that, um, what happens? Does a lawyer, uh, is that the end of it, or does a lawyer get some education beyond that after they get to be a lawyer? No, they're required every three years to do continuing legal education, and part of that continuing legal education, a portion of that has to be ethics, which means they have to take courses to continue to learn, because the rules change all the time. So uh, tell me, uh, Scott, how many hours uh, do you have to have as a lawyer, CLE? We have to have every three, three years, we have a 30 hour cycle and we just sent a rule up to the Florida Supreme Court to increase that by two hours, I believe, to add technology credits to our requirements. All right. In just a few minutes, we're gonna be talking about the process to take an example of, 
a person who has a complaint against a lawyer and carrying that all the way through, assuming the worst case for the, the attorney. But before we do that, just give me some examples, Sheila. What are the types of things that lawyers do that get them in trouble with the bar? Um, the things as little as communicating with their client to all the way to stealing money from their trust account. So there's, there's a large spectrum of what they can get in trouble for to minor things to very serious uh, misconduct. And so the, the, the way the grievance committee is set up, first off, tell me what a grievance committee is, um, Scott. A, a grievance committee, in, in depending on the size of your circuit and counties, will, will depend on how many grievance committees you have. But a grievance committee is like a grand jury that will, at some point in the grievance process, listen to the facts, investigate the facts, and determine if an attorney has, uh, if there's probable cause against an attorney to show that they violated the rules of professional conduct. Give me some examples, Scott, of uh, incidences that have been brought to the grievance committee that you've sat on that are kind of typical, if there are such typical ones, or things that you think um, that you can remember that were, uh, might be of interest. You know, we have three, there's actually three grievance committees in our circuit that I oversee. We have seen the very worst where attorneys are stealing uh, client trust funds, which, which is an anomaly that doesn't happen all the time. We see cases where attorneys just don't maintain their trust records appropriately, where attorneys don't return phone calls, where they're unprofessional in court to a judge. Uh, we see where they're not diligent in their case and don't file something they should. It really does run the gamut and we, we do see a little bit of everything. Some of the things that I see, uh, have seen as a judge involve attorneys taking a case that they're really not competent to handle. In other words, the temptation for the lawyer because of the fee or whatever, they'll come to court, uh, maybe they were practicing in the criminal court and now they're looking at a family matter and they really haven't prepared themselves adequately for that. Those can lead to complaints too. Uh, the other thing that I've seen from a judicial standpoint, and this is really important for the public to know, is that when a lawyer represents something to the court, it's got to be true. And one of the most serious things that can happen to an attorney is to misrepresent to the court because they're officers of the court. And I'll give you an example of that. In a case, for example, uh, a lawyer comes in and asks an attorney for a continuance and you ask, okay, why do you want a continuance? This case has been around for a year and it hasn't been resolved. Why hasn't it been moving? And the lawyer will say, well, I thought it was going to be fine, Judge, but I've got another trial in Fort Myers and it conflicts with this and I, I apologize but I, I really need to get this off so that I can handle the other case. And then we find out the other case was continued two days before. So the attorney gained an advantage by getting an extension that he or she should not have gotten and um, we come down very hard on that and once that attorney makes that misrepresentation it's going to be very hard to gain the trust of that judge again and that's a grievance. It can be sent to the, to the bar for grievance. So. How, does a, uh, how, how many grievance committees are there? I mean, uh, Sheila, do you happen to know uh, statewide? Statewide, I don't know how many. I can tell you there are, every circuit has at least one that's in the entire state. Um, many of our circuits have two or three, as Scott was saying, depending on the size of your circuit. So um, every circuit has at least one grievance committee. I would say normally there's two because our circuits are large enough to have two. Um, and it's good to have two because then, you know, depending on your circuit, you can change um, cases between them for conflicts. Um, I don't know if Scott mentioned, but our grievance committees are made up of local attorneys and local non-lawyers. Right, I'm gonna ask you, uh, you're a member of the Board of Governors. Tell me how you got that position and what is the Board of Governors for the Florida Bar? Sure, yes sir. It's, it's an elected position. So the attorneys in our circuit get to elect a representative. Depending on the size of your circuit, Miami and Fort Lauderdale will have multiple members on the Board of Governors. Sarasota, Manatee, Minnesota have one and it's me. So this is my second term. The Board of Governors are 52 members and the best way to say it is they are basically like a board of directors that runs the Florida Bar. They're an elected board and they oversee everything the bar does, including the bar's prosecution and handling of discipline matters. And we'll get to there because they get very involved towards the end of the case, actually as the case goes on actually. So tell me about how a person or a lawyer gets to be on the grievance committee, Scott. They get appointed by 
me as the Board of Governors representative. Uh, different circuits, obviously, you have different members, but for Sarasota, Manatee, and DeSoto, it's me. So when I choose someone on each grievance committee, we try to have it well balanced. You, you have to have a third public members, and the rest have to be attorneys. But we like to have someone in each area of law. So I want to make sure I have a family law, a, a probate and trust, which is wills. I like to have a personal injury attorney because they have to investigate claims on for all different areas. So I like it to be somewhat balanced. All right. And so uh, you mentioned um, non-lawyer members. Uh, what's that? How's that work? You got somebody that uh, doesn't have any familiarity with the law. What's the reason to have them on the on the grievance committees? You know, I think the reason is to sh to have a different perspective when you're looking at these cases. At the end of all this, everyone has to remember we're we're protecting the public from any wrongdoing. The vast majority of of attorneys do not do anything wrong, and they're very ethical. But one of our jobs as the bar is to protect the public. So to have a public member there, it gives us some insight from a consumer, from the public, and they have a different perspective sometimes than attorneys do on some of these matters. You know, I, I served uh, a couple of rotations when I was a lawyer on the grievance committee, and I was a little surprised that the uh, the, the non-lawyer was a little bit more forgiving <laughs> of some of these things that lawyers take very seriously. Uh, sometimes the, the, the non-lawyer would say, well, you know, what's the big deal about this? But has that been your experience? Yes, I can tell you. Um, in the 17 years I've been here on the different grievance committees that I've been bar counsel for many times, the lawyers are like, what? What? You don't want to do anything? And the, the non-lawyer's like, is this really that big of a deal? It was just a mistake. You know, why, why do we want to do something to the lawyer? I, I think, uh, and I, I did it back before they actually had lay people on the, on the uh, panels. And, the interesting thing was uh, the concept was they were going to be more harsh. Yeah. It was just the opposite. <laughs> is that your experience too? It, it, it is. They, uh, I don't think people realize how strict our rules are and, and what we have to do. I mean, even when you're not acting as an attorney, if I send a letter out and I misrepresent something to someone, that's inappropriate for an attorney to act that way. So I don't think the public understands sometimes that these rules we have in place are very strict. Well, let's, let's take kind of a 20,000 foot view of this. Uh, how many complaints uh, are lodged against this 100,000 group of lawyers, uh, say last year, do you have any idea? Yeah, last year there was about 5,300 complaints um, brought to the bar's attention by the public. Or, or you know, they, they can come from judges, opposing counsel, but from the public in general. And trend-wise, how has it been, say, the last three or four years? It's actually gone down. Um, one of the reasons I think that it has, it was probably in the $7,000 7, range for about three or four years, and then um, the bar developed a um, center where we have lawyers available to the public to call and try to resolve their matters. Um, we refer to it as ACAP and they can call there and our lawyers try to help them assist them with their issue with their lawyer right over the phone. So the fact that you had maybe 5,000 or so complaints last year doesn't mean all those necessarily were were uh, had good reasons. Some of them may be things that you could look at initially and say that's really not a grievance or some other issue that can be resolved without a complaint. Oh, definitely, because out of those 5,000 complaints, probably only 300, maybe 400 go anywhere. Um, so a lot of them are closed because a lot of times non-lawyers don't understand their lawyer is doing something just because they're not communicating every day with them. So um, that's why I think we get a lot of communication complaints because they don't understand the status of their case. And so that's a situation where somebody hires a lawyer, they call the lawyer, what's going on with my case? They don't hear it back and then that log jam can be broken, uh, I can assure you that a call from the bar would get their attention. Correct. Right? Okay. But the ACAP stands for Attorney Consumer Assistance Program. That's correct. So let's take a typical complaint. Let's assume this particular complaint has some merit to it. It looks like it could violate the Code of Professional uh, Regulation, uh, the Rules of Professional Conduct. Let's talk about those first. Where can somebody go to see them in writing? How does one find out about the rules of professional conduct? Okay, they can go to the Florida Bar's website, which is floridabar.org, and there you can actually receive complaint forms. We have a host section for the public at our website, which is um, gives them all the information of, um, as you said, our ACAP. It also tells them how to file a bar complaint, tells them what type of discipline, what we look for, um, tells them about our fee arbitration. Gives a lot of information to the public, so it's a great resource for them to go to before they file the bar complaint, so they can find out information in ways maybe that may help them understand. We even have frequently asked questions um, at the website for them. You 
mentioned fee arbitration, so uh, Scott, uh, a lot of complaints that the bar gets is uh, concerns fees and that sort of thing. How does that process work? It, the fees may not be an ethical issue where it's a violation of anything. It may just be a dispute over monies that were paid or charged where someone may not think that they were, that they were earned or that they charge more than they should. There's a fee arbitration and mediation program that the bar has that will send the attorney and the client to an arbitration or mediation procedure where they can try to work that out. And it does very well. Okay, so we're coming back to our example. There's been a complaint made. Now, that complaint could have come from a judge. It could have come from uh, another lawyer. As a matter of fact, isn't there a duty upon lawyers to report uh, violations of the, co of the uh, uh, responsibility rules. It, it is. It, the rules regulating the Florida Bar say that if you see something that violates the rules, you are supposed to report it. We have a parallel to that with uh, child abuse things. You know, we're mandatory reporters when it comes to those sort of things in the judiciary and, and other folks. And so it's kind of the same thing with members of the bar. You find somebody who's doing something violating the rules, you got to come forward. And we've actually had examples of that in, in our circuit where lawyers have had to report their their partners because their partner was violating it and they, it breaks their heart, but they say rules are rules and you got to do it. Otherwise they get in trouble. So okay, it comes to you. What's the investigation process at that point, Sheila? Okay, once we receive an actual written complaint and they file the bar complaint, it's reviewed by one of our bar counsel. They determine if the attorney needs to answer that complaint. So once the attorney files a response, the, com the actual non-lawyer, you know, the complainant can file a rebuttal. That's reviewed. Sometimes we use investigators to go get court files. An auditor may look at the file. We have auditors in every one of our branches if there's a trust issue. And then a determination is made if that file can be closed. Um, if it can be closed at the staff level, then the um, person who's filed the complaints informed why. You know, there's not an issue here or this is what your lawyer did do on your behalf and they're acting as they should. If the bar counsel thinks there's something more that needs to be investigated, then it will go on to the grievance committee that Scott described earlier for them to do further investigation and see if there's actual probable cause of a rule violation. Is there an approximate time frame from the time the complaint's made until the decision is made whether it goes to be closed or whether it goes to the grievance committee? Um, most times that can be done probably within a three month period because each person's given an amount of time. Um, once a complaint's received and reviewed, an attorney's given a couple weeks to file a response, um, the complainant's given another three weeks to file a rebuttal, and then if there's investigation work, it's assigned to one of our investigators, if our auditor has to do an audit. So a lot of times it's very difficult. A lot of times people will ask us, how long will this take? Sometimes it depends how involved the case is. If it's something very simple where there was a communication issue, the attorneys responded to that, that can be closed fairly quickly. It might be gone in a couple months. If it's something that requires us to do an audit to see if they've got the right records, that can take several months. Okay, so uh, Scott, this is before it gets to the grievance committee stage. You mentioned investigators. Uh, what are their backgrounds? Almost all the investigators that work for the Florida Bar were former FBI agents, CIA agents, um, police officers. Um, we have someone in our office um, that was a former police officer now. He was a um, private detective. Um, so most of them come from some background, some legal background, you know, either in law enforcement, and then they come and they work for the Bar. How do you go about getting copies of records or uh, documents that you need to make the assessment at that stage? Um, a lot of different ways. Sometimes we'll ask the attorney for their file. Sometimes we ask the complainant for things that they have. The investigator may have to go to a court file, may have to go to an insurance company. We do have subpoena power, so we can subpoena a bank or an insurance company to get records that we need to look at things. Sometimes we even have to go to third parties, um, people that might know information, say a, a former employee of the lawyer or somebody else on the outside that was present to get a statement from them. So you can actually subpoena? Yes. Okay. And Scott, you mentioned that uh, one of the violations that's considered very serious are trust account violations. And there's probably a spectrum of, of uh, violations on trust account. Can you give us examples of ones that may not be considered too serious versus the ones that would really uh, be a, a very grievous uh, problem for an attorney? Sure, the, the trust accounting rules are very specific. They have certain rules you have to keep records every, every month. You have to reconcile, you have to... Uh, let me pause yes. just a minute. What is trust account money? I mean, how does a, how does a lawyer get trust sure, account? Sure, trust account money is, an attorney will have its own operating account, which it puts the attorney's money. Trust account money is client money, whether it's 
money that a client is paying on uh, a retainer for future fees, whether it's funds from a settlement, whether it's funds from a closing that the attorney's holding. Whenever an attorney's holding someone else's money, it's not like other professions. There's very strict rules how you account for the money, there's very strict rules on how you keep records, and there's very strict rules when you can even transfer that money. So because of that, the minor violations we'll see sometimes is when an attorney will make a mistake and deposit something in his operating instead of his trust in a, in a check may bounce, and they fix it the next day. That will be a violation, and then if the bar gets involved, they'll usually send them to an, a, an accounting school, a trust workshop, so they don't make that mistake again. The other end is where an attorney just steals the money. It's a very small minority, but we have seen that where attorneys take client funds. And tell me how quickly the bar reacts to that. As soon, if, if there's a case where an attorney's stealing funds, that's one of the few situations where there's an automatic motion for an emergency suspension. The bar comes, gets involved, they get their auditor look at the file, and they move for the Supreme Court to do an emergency suspension of that attorney so he, he or she can't do it to anybody else if that's the case. So the concept of, a, for example, a retainer, a lawyer says, I'll represent you, but you need to give me $5,000, I'll bill against that, I'll do work against that, and then you will refresh that at the end when it starts getting low. Uh, so the attorney can take money out of, out of that trust account as he or she does work, so they can pay their secretaries and themselves and their overhead, et cetera. But it would be improper, for example, for an attorney to take test, uh, trust account money and pay their mortgage. Yeah, they, they can't do that. And then even when you're doing taking trust account money for fees, the client is supposed to get a record of it so they can see what hours are billed. In personal injury cases, usually there's a disbursement sheet depending on when money is dispersed. You can't use as an attorney your trust account, which is client's money, to pay any of your personal expenses. And on top of that, our rules say that if a fee is earned, an attorney can't leave that money in the trust account. They have to take it out. They can't commingle their money with, an, with the client's money. And she like take it, these are fairly complex rules about how to handle a trust account. How does the bar help lawyers follow the rules? Well, we do quite a few things. Um, one, at our website, besides having a section for um, non-lawyers, we have a whole entire section at our website for lawyers. Um, there's a uh, practice resource institute that's been um, put up at our website that's very, very helpful for lawyers. Shows them everything from managing a law practice to running your trust account. Gives them all kinds of resources available to them. We also have an ethics hotline for lawyers so they can call and ask any questions um, about the rules and what they should be doing. Um, and our bar counsel and my, you know, and our chief branch dif disciplinary counsels like myself go out and speak all the time. I speak at um, bar association meetings in the courts. We speak at. Um, we make ourselves available so that we can educate lawyers. Uh, as I said earlier, the rules do change, and it's not something they're going to be studying every day in their practice when they're out practicing. So it's a great way to go out and try to educate them more on what they're required to do. Sometimes um, a lawyer will get in trouble with substance abuse or maybe have a mental illness uh, and it becomes apparent uh, to others around and maybe other lawyers or it could be clients that the person has an addiction or uh, maybe needs uh, some sort of therapies. What does the bar do to help attorneys in that situation? Okay, um, there's the Florida Lawyers Assistance Program. It's not part of the Florida Bar, but it does work with the Florida Bar. They are confidential. Um, we will send a letter to them immediately when we know there's a lawyer that needs help with that. We'll reach out to the lawyer. Um, most times what happens to those lawyers, um, these are even lawyers who are arrested for um, driving under the influence. We will um, try to have them be evaluated by Florida Lawyers Assistance to see if they need more assistance, see if they need a contract with them so that they can monitor them and give them the therapy. Maybe they need to go work with someone. There's a lot of lawyers that Florida Lawyers Assistance helps without drug problems or drinking, um, stress, depression. Um, that is going around a lot, so they help with that and send them for the therapy they need, and then they monitor them for a number of years, sometimes three years their contracts are for. And, and the lawyer can actually agree to voluntarily submit to this uh, to start get the treatment or the help that he or she needs, and then uh, they're, they're hooked up to a monitor, to somebody, another lawyer that watches them to make sure things are going straight? Yes. Okay. Um, Scott, what happens when a lawyer gets convicted of a felony? When a lawyer is convicted of a felony, that would be the second situation where you'll see the bar move for an emergency suspension as well. And that will also go to the Supreme Court and 99% of the time if there's a felony conviction will immediately move for a suspension, right. an emergency suspension. 
Well, we've talked about the investigative part of this where you get the complaint, you've examined it, uh, now you think there, are, there is a basis for the grievance committee to convene to consider whether or not probable cause can be established. Up to this point, it's confidential, is that right? That's correct. What's the reason for that? Well, one of the reasons for that is until the investigation is done, we don't give that information out because if you had given that out to the public, you may ruin someone's reputation on something that's not there, you know, is not complete, there's nothing wrong. Um, but it is open to the public even after we close the file, though. So once it's closed, it is open, but while we're doing the investigation, we don't make them public. Um, while we're doing our investigation, if somebody were to call in and want to know if this lawyer has any complaints against them, we would tell them anything that had been closed, but not something that we're currently working on. Okay, so Scott, you're, say you're the member of a grievance committee, and uh, how do you learn this case has been referred to you for consideration? The grievance committees meet once a month, uh, and they have a website, there's a portal where they look at the documents that are filed and are uploaded. Each grievance committee has a, a bar counsel that's in that committee that it instructs them and helps them with what the grievance is. This is and an attorney assigned by this, the Florida this Bar? This is an attorney assigned. The Florida Bar has its own counsel. Sheila heads the Tampa branch. There's five branches, Orlando, Tampa, Tallahassee. Fort Lauderdale and Miami. Right? So there are staff attorneys that work just for the Florida Bar that act as prosecutors in these cases and they prosecute these grievances and ethical cases. They are all assigned to a specific grievance committee. They're there to assist the grievance committee make its decision and when you're on the committee you'll, you'll see an agenda, you'll see on the website new cases, you'll review them and you'll have meetings once a month to discuss. During these meetings uh, is the attorney who's the target of the discipline part of that? Not, not always. Sometimes there will be actual hearings and sometimes they will ask that attorney to, to have a statement taken. Sometimes the attorney does want to be there to give a statement, but most times it's the committee. Each case is assigned a specific committee member that we call the investigating member. They're assisted with the case by bar counsel and, and bar staff attorneys and they investigate to see if there is probable cause for the complaint that was filed. How do you ensure that the attorney who's doing that or a member of the grievance committee doesn't have a relationship that could possibly impede their, uh, their evaluation of that evidence? We tell everyone, and, and we are in a smaller community compared to some of the other you know, jurisdictions, we tell anyone that if you have any relationship where there even is going to be an appearance of impropriety, you should recuse yourself, which means step away from the case. You won't investigate it, you won't make a decision, and you can't give any input on the case. And I suppose you could also refer it to the other committee in the circuit. You could if there's enough members on the certain grievance committee that, that it's going to be possibly an appearance of impropriety, you could send it to a different committee. So if a member of the grievance committee is too good a friend with the accused or perhaps has had uh, some enmity between the two of them that has they have a history or whatever, those people should withdraw and not be a participant. They should if it's someone they practice law with, if it's someone they have a lot of cases with perhaps, if it's something where they have a, a bad feeling about them, they should step away from the case. Okay. And how do you select the, uh, the non-lawyer members of the grievance committee? What do you look for? That's, I mean, what's, what, what's hard to explain to folks is everything we do is volunteer. I volunteer, I don't get paid. The grievance committee members don't get paid. And then the public members don't get paid. We try to find other professionals that would like to do this. It, it's something where you know, they, they want to give back a little bit to the community and they do want to help. So we try, I try to find folks that are in, in different areas and different professions to sit on the committees. It, it's hard to do because obviously it does take a lot of time. It's, it can be stressful sometimes and it's purely volunteer. Well, I can remember several grievance committee meetings that went on for several days. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it can be get very, uh, complex and involved. Uh, you want to be fair to everybody, the client and the attorney, and sometimes it takes time to sort through that. So you've, you've made a reference to one of the things that the grievance committee can do, which is, you mentioned it's like a grand jury, they could find probable cause that there's been a violation of the rules of professional conduct. They could find there's no probable cause, in which case it, I guess it wouldn't go any further. Right. Correct. But there's other options. Can't the grievance committee uh, recommend other sanctions or approaches for this person? Um, assuming it, it's not probable cause, but you're looking at it and say, you know, this, this needs to have something else happen. What are those other alternatives? You can have no probable cause where they send a letter of advice, where they say there, there's no probable cause here, but this 
probably something you shouldn't do again, or here's where we think you maybe you, you did something wrong. Like you need a refresher on this subject matter of the law or rules or something like that to get them educated better. Per, yeah, perhaps. Um, don't text your clients late at night. You know, that's not professional, but it's not a violation. Um, there is diversion where they can send, where the grievance committee can divert the case. It would not be a discipline mark on the attorney's record, but perhaps someone just needs ethics school or they need a trust accounting workshop. They can divert the case, send them to that type of a program to help them out. The grievance committee, if there's a criminal case going, can, can basically put the grievance on hold until that criminal case is over to see what occurs in that case. And there's also the lowest level of discipline, which is a minor misconduct, where they say it's, it's misconduct, it's, it's not enough for a formal you know, complaint to go much further, but we're going to give you an admonishment, which is a document saying you've done something wrong. And, and one of the reasons for deferring the, the disciplinary action, say, in a criminal case, is that the accused is not able to defend themselves because of the Fifth Amendment privilege. Obviously, uh, his or her criminal defense attorney is going to say, you don't want to go in front of the grievance committee right now. We'll, we'll defer that until you get your other case resolved. Exactly. Okay. So uh, you, you do have sanctions that can happen that uh, don't involve um, our recommendations that can happen, like an ad advisory thing. The idea is to make the, the, the person a better lawyer, right? Yes. So let's say that we now have a finding of probable cause. Where does it go from there, Sheila? Okay, um, there's a couple options. After the Cruz Committee finds probable cause, an attorney has an uh, opportunity to go back to the grievance committee and say, I'll accept a minor misconduct. That's something they can do. Uh, there's a rule on it, so there's only certain cases that can come back for minor misconduct. If it's not one of those cases for a minor misconduct, then it would go on to us uh, filing a formal complaint. However, before filing a formal complaint, there's a letter sent out to the attorney to ask them if they'd like to try to resolve the matter. Our rules allow for what's called a consent judgment, and that would be where a lawyer is going to plead guilty to the facts and some rule violations and a sanction, and that would be filed with the Supreme Court. Um, if he chooses not to do that, then we file a formal complaint. That formal complaint's actually filed in the Supreme Court. Um, so then it gets filed there, and we go on like you would any in a civil case, pretty close to it. We have discovery, and then we go to trial, and then we have a sanctions hearing. Okay, now the complaint itself, it identifies particular parts of the rules of professional conduct. So it tells the person, this is what is being alleged against you. And then they can prepare and say, we didn't, I didn't do that or whatever. And then it goes in front of, uh, um, where does it go? Who decides the case? Okay, the Supreme Court will assign it to what they call a referee, but that referee is actually a sitting circuit or county um, judge in the state of Florida. Normally, if they're in one circuit, it will be assigned to another circuit that's close to them, not the circuit they actually practice in, except for Miami. Miami is usually all their cases are assigned to Miami. They're pretty large, so there's a place there the court can find it. But they assign it to an um, actual judge, and they're called a referee, and then they hear the matter. And you're correct. The complaint will allege um, all the facts against them, and it will also allege which rules they have violated. Um, and then they get an opportunity to respond to that and do their own discovery and prove whether or not they violated those rules. All right. Now, you, you told us before that there's about 5,000 complaints made, at least last year there were. Out of those, how many of those get to the probable cause uh, hearing stage where you're actually having a referee appointed? Do you know roughly how many? About 300. About 300. Yeah. Well, I can tell you the procedure from the judicial standpoint is that you'll get a call from the court administrator and saying, uh, guess what, <laughs> you're going to Lee County. <laughs> because we like to have these hearings, the judges uh, will be assigned as a referee and we'll go to Lee County or Charlotte County outside of our circuit, as you mentioned. Never been to Pinellas or uh, Hillsborough. They probably yeah. switch off, most yeah. likely. But uh, judges go, and we just so you'll know, there's a rotating list. Every judge has got to do it. The chief judge keeps a list of this. So. <laughs> when your time's up, and sometimes those hearings can go on for several days. Yes. I remember one of our judges got one that went three weeks, mm -hmm. and it was very, very controversial. Now, uh, up until the point that the probable cause is referred, you have the finding of probable cause, what is confidential and what isn't? 
Okay, up until, conf uh, up until probable cause, the file is confidential. Once probable cause is found, then the file is open to the public. All public documents are open to the public. So anything that's public in our file, correspondence that came back and forth between the attorney and the complainant that came to our office, uh, documents we might have received from a court, um, those would all be open to the public. Um, so anything that we received that was part of that investigation will become open to the public once probable cause is found. Same as as we start to do our discovery, our hearings are open to the public, our discovery, our filings are open to the public. Um, they're actually filed with the referee. So those, if, the, if somebody called and said, can I have a copy of that formal complaint? Yes, they can get a copy of the complaint we file. And at that stage, the uh, media can be present and report on everything. It's open, yeah. right? Like, you know, like any court proceeding in Florida, well, most court proceedings. Right. Scott, have you been present at one of these uh, trials where they're trying to determine whether or not the, the probable cause has been found and the person is defending themselves? I, am, I have not. I've actually seen some on TV, but I have not been present. Our job, it, we'll take it a step back, the Board of Governors oversees this process throughout. So even after the grievance committee makes a decision, if it's whether it's probable cause or no probable cause, the board representative is called a designated reviewer. I review that decision to see if I agree. If I disagree, it goes in front of the Board of Governors through the disciplinary review committee. If I agree, then I'll go to the next step. So I have options after it comes from the grievance committee where I can do certain things. I can send it back if I don't agree with the decision. I can, if I, if I want to say there's probable cause when they say there's not, it'll go to the Board of Governors. So being in that position, it's sometimes I shouldn't be involved in the grievance committee process because I'm the one making the decision. I don't want them to rely on my opinion on it. And also with some of these cases, it's not best for us to be involved that closely because we have to oversee the decision that needs to be made depending on what it is. Okay. so. Sheila, tell me what the referee has to do at the end of the case. Uh, after, the, after he or she has heard this is a judge sitting as a referee, what he or she has to do at that stage, what is that person called upon to do? And what's the, what's the burden of proof? Okay, our burden of proof is clear and convincing evidence. Um, and what the referee needs to do is they hear all the evidence. They're really the finder of fact. They, they listen to all the testimony, they listen to the witnesses, they see all the evidence, they make a determination whether or not the lawyer has violated the rules and the allegations if they've been proven by the bar by clear and convincing evidence. They write what's called their report and recommendation. Um, that is where they'll set forth whether they believe we've proved what's in our complaint, whether we've proved the rule violations. They'll set forth the testimony if they felt it was credible or not. What um, then they'll set forth the sanction they think is appropriate if they found misconduct. They'll support that with case law from the Supreme Court. And then they'll file that report and recommendation to the Supreme Court. One of the things that the public um, needs to understand is even though that judge has heard this case and made that recommendation, that lawyer is not sanctioned at that time. Um, the Supreme Court has given us our license to practice law and they make the final decision whether or not that sanction goes forward. So a lot of times when we give someone a copy of a report and recommendation once it's filed, they think the lawyer can no longer practice law if it says suspension, but they can until the Supreme Court order comes out. Uh, Scott, you were mentioning uh, the Board of Governors' participation at that level. I mean, how often does it happen that a um, reviewing attorney or a Board of Governors member uh, does something different than what the committee, uh, the grievance committee recommends? You know, it doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. And, and also, the designated reviewer, after the referee makes a decision, has to make a decision also on whether they appeal anything from the finding, whether it's guilt or not, of different violations. An attorney can be charged with violating 10 rules, and the referee may say it's only two. And also the punishment, you know, what it may be. The, the designated reviewer may think it should be something more severe or less severe, and they can, they can appeal that finding. But we try not to over, we, I, try not, I personally feel I, that the grievance committee does hard work, and they're the ones who are looking at everything, and that I try not to overturn it. But as a reviewer, we look at everything, and we think it's wrong, we will. If it goes to the Board of Governors, is it like a, a retrial of that issue? Or how, what does the Board of Governors do? Do they agree with you or disagree? Or we, we have two different levels. There's the Disciplinary Review Committee, which every <laughs> new board member has to be on. It's the largest committee on the board. It's 26 members. We vote. We vote whether they agree or they don't agree. We have to read materials before each meeting. It's a summary from Bar Council and all the backup documents. So we have 
depending on the case, very vigorous debates on whether what the grievance committee did was correct or what the referee did was correct, should we appeal or not. And they can be very long meetings. And then the Board of Governors then reviews what the Disciplinary Review Committee does, the full board, all 52. So it, it's a big process. It's not a full trial, but it, it does get looked at. How often does the Board of Governors meet of the Florida Bar? We meet every other month, but we meet by committee, by phone, you know, depending on what we have to do. There's an executive committee, which is the president and certain elected boards. They meet all the time to make decisions on certain matters that, that may have to be made expeditiously, but we meet scheduled every other month. While we're on the subject, what are the other uh, responsibilities of the Board of Governors? I know it's a little bit off topic, but I think it would sure. be helpful to get an idea of how the Board of Governors actually governs the Florida Bar. From, you know, from the way the rules are drafted and approved, uh, the Board of Governors looks at that. The Board of Governors sets the budget for the bar. The, the Board of Governors deals with everything that the bar has to deal with. Uh, we, we don't make the rules and their rules once we agree to them. Everything we do, we send up to the Florida Supreme Court. So we look at rules on advertising. We look on rules on trust accounts, ethical rules, those rules we all review. We also are in charge of the unlicensed practice of law prosecution for the Florida Bar. And as long as everything else an attorney does, we are the ones who sort of set the parameters for that. Okay. Let's talk about the spectrum of sanctions that can be uh, given to an attorney who's found to violate. Does it automatically result in a suspension or uh, disbarment of the attorney? No. In fact, um, the referee can recommend and the Supreme Court can agree to give an attorney anything from an admonishment to a public reprimand, which would mean that lawyer would be publicly reprimanded or admonished, but they could still continue to practice law. Then they can give a suspension from anywhere from one day to 90 days. That means that lawyer is suspended for that period of time, and after those days are up, they can go back to practicing law. The difference becomes when a suspension is over 90 days, 91 days or more. Those are very serious um, suspensions because the lawyer does not come back to practice the law after 91 days. They have to petition for reinstatement to come back, which means right now I think it's taking 8 to 12 months is I think the average for an attorney who's suspended for 91 days if he gets back in. Because when they petition for reinstatement, now the burden is on them to show that they're fit to practice law again. So they'll have to show they're fit to practice. And if the Supreme Court agrees with them, then they'll enter an order allowing them to come back to practice. There are many lawyers in the state who have been suspended for 91 days or more and have never petitioned even to come back to the practice of law. So those are all our suspensions. Our suspensions go up to three years. So from one day to three years, and as I said, 91 days to three years are very serious sanctions because they're called rehabilitative suspensions. Then after that, there's disbarment. Um, and a disbarment runs for five years unless it's enhanced. There are enhancement disbarments that are given to lawyers for 10 years or 15 years. And then we have permanent disbarment, which means a lawyer can never come back to practice law again. On those more serious ones, what sort of offenses has a lawyer committed to become uh, sanctioned in one of those ways? Um, most disbarments that you see and in, in enhanced disbarments are um, the theft of client funds. Uh, they, in abandonment of practice, lawyers who have left their practice and they've just abandoned their clients and just took off. Okay, and so there's some offenses that they'll never get their license back. That's correct. What do, what's to stop them from going to another state? Well, most states, um, and, I, and I originally, as I told you, I did this in Illinois, most states do what's called reciprocal discipline. So once they find out that a lawyer has been disciplined in another state, they will also discipline them there. Um, us as the Florida Bar, what we do, our bar counsel, is try to determine if a lawyer has a license in another state when we're, pro when we're investigating them. If we find that out and then, they're, and then they're disciplined, we send that discipline to the state where they have another law license. And does that allow them to practice in federal court if they've had a suspension or a disbarment here? My understanding is no. If they're suspended, then they, sh they, they should not be practicing in the federal court. Obviously, the federal court would have to know they're suspended, um, but they shouldn't be practicing if they have a suspension. Okay. So now we've got a situation where the referee has made a recommendation for a sanction, and the referee then sends that to the Florida Supreme Court? Yes. What do they do? Then they review 
um, what's been sent up to them. Either party can appeal what that referee's recommended. Um, that's where the court may get involved in what's called our oral arguments. Say um, the referee reported and said that the attorney should be suspended for 91 days. And that's what the bar asked for, so we're happy with the recommendation. The Board of Governors agrees with us, but the attorney wants to appeal that. The attorney can appeal that sanction and that report, and then usually what happens is the court tells us to brief for, um, file briefs. They'll file their brief, we'll file ours, and then one party could ask for oral argument. The court could accept that. They'll hear everything, read the briefs, and then they'll enter the final opinion as to what they believe the appropriate discipline should be um, and what they feel the facts were found. When you say oral argument, they actually go in front of the Supreme Court and the lawyer argues why he or she shouldn't get the sanction or whatever, and then the Supreme Court decides? Yes. Have you had examples of that, uh, Scott? We see it all the time. I mean, it happens quite a bit. I mean, most, most attorneys that are disciplined will hire a specific private attorney to represent them, and we do, because as Sheila said, a 91-day suspension is really a year and 91 days. It's not a 91-day suspension. So for someone who has that type of suspension, they may never practice again, so some of them do take it all the way to the Supreme Court. And the bar, if we do not think the suspension is harsh enough or any other sort of discipline is harsh enough, we will appeal it and we'll do the same thing. Uh, I have noticed in watching the Supreme Court's decisions that they're not shy about rejecting the referee's uh, recommendations for sanctions. Would you, have you had that experience? Yes. <clears throat> give, me, um, give me an example of... There's been a number of examples, um, and, and not just the report of referees. Um, there have been times that even consent judgments have been sent to the court, and, they're not, and you're correct. They're not shy in telling you that they don't agree with that. But there have been a number of reporter referees that have gone to the Supreme Court recommending something, and the court does not agree. Usually you'll see that one or the other party appeals. Um, it's interesting because in the last few years you'll see a number of times that the attorney has appealed the report and recommendation and it's gone to the court and they think it's too harsh, the attorney, and the court has given them something harsher than their report or referee was. Um, so yes, I, I have seen that quite a bit. How long have you been doing this in Florida? In Florida for the last 17 years. Now, have you seen um, a trend by the Supreme Court to be less tolerant on certain things? Uh, I mean, I look at the opinions coming out uh, there seems to be uh, a very vigorous attempt by the S Supreme Court to know that they're serious about lawyers complying with these rules. Would you agree with that? Uh, I agree 100%. Probably the one area I would say you can definitely see where the Supreme Court is trending is professionalism. Yeah. They do not take unprofessional attorneys lightly. Uh, a lot of cases we see where there'll be a 30-day suspension or a 20-day suspension from the referee and the Supreme Court may do 90 days, may do a year. They, they do not like attorneys to be unprofessional to the public, to other attorneys, uh, and that's anything from name calling, being disrespectful to a judge, threatening opposing counsel during depots. And again, these are very, you know, this is in this very slim minority of times, but when that happens, the Supreme Court takes it very, very seriously. You know, what I've seen in, in court too is an unfortunate number of very young lawyers who think that the, the real courtroom is like the TV courtroom, mm -hmm. and they get into bantering uh, with the opposing attorney or being disrespectful to counsel, co counsel, or the opposing counsel or the judge, and they've got to be straightened out pretty quick. And, mm -hmm. and we have a process here where we try to refer them to uh, a mentor to say, you know, we don't want to take this to grievance level yet, but you've got to get your act together and you've got to start being uh, professional. And, and so we've been very insistent, and the local bar association has been very aggressive about teaching professionalism to uh, lawyers. And as I say, most of them tend to be pretty green. But uh, usually when we come down hard on that, they learn pretty quick. Or they don't practice, at least, uh, very successfully <laughs> when, that ha when that happens. So the Supreme Court gets it, and then what sort of things does the lawyer have to do? Are there like uh, fines or penalties? Is there a money uh, situation? How does that work, Scott? It, it can be any of the above. The, the Supreme Court, depending on what it does, I mean, talking about the 91-day suspension, the rehabilitative, they have to prove their rehabilitation. And if they lose at the Supreme Court, they have to pay all of the bar's costs, and they have to go back in front of the same referee and show they've been rehabilitated, which may include doing community service, 
may include showing that they have a clean work history. For folks that have been disbarred that have to come back, they have to go in front of the Florida Board of Bar Examiners. They have to reapply, do a new fitness and character evaluation. They have to take the Florida Bar again. So the, depending on what the sentence is from the Supreme Court, there can be money sanctions, there can be probation, there can be retaking the bar, depending on what the actual disciplinary sanction is. And I've seen cases uh, where there's been what is called a public reprimand. How does that work, Sheila? Okay, um, there's two ways the public reprimand can work. It can be a public reprimand by publication in the Southern Reporter from the Supreme Court. And then there's public reprimands where the Supreme Court, where they have to appear before the Board of Governors and receive their public reprimand. Tell me how that works. It's, uh, you do not want to be the attorney who, who has that type of reprimand. We'll sometimes send it locally, but the reprimand will be the attorney whose discipline will walk into the middle of the room during one of our meetings. We have 52 people in a kind of a square table so we all can see each other. And that attorney will sit there while the president, it, I don't want to say yells at them, but tells them what they've done wrong, tells them what we expect of them, and tells them how they've they have not followed the rules of regulating the Florida bar. It, it's not a situation an attorney would want to be in. How about probation? Can a lawyer get probation? Yes, and, and probation is given, um, a, a, we talked earlier about Florida lawyers assistance. There are times that lawyers are put on probation to be monitored um, while they're on a Florida lawyers um, uh, contract with them. There are times lawyers are put on probation to do various things. Sometimes they may have to complete certain things such as I talked about earlier, like ethics school, or they may have to do continue, more continuing legal ed in a certain area. We've done that before where a lawyer practices maybe in appellate work and doesn't seem to be doing what they need to do, so we send them for additional um, continuing legal ed classes. So probation can be something in itself. Most times you'll see that added with some discipline, like it'd be a public reprimand with probation, a suspension with probation, and then there's terms of the probation they have to comply with. If they don't, they get reported to the court for contempt. You know, a lot of the problems that lawyers get into is in the area of advertising. Mm. What are some of the rules that control advertising for lawyers, Scott? The Florida Bar has, has quite a bit with rules for advertising. There are certain things that you can and can't say. Uh, some, of the, some of the bigger things you will see is in personal injury, and there's rules that an attorney can't say anything that's not objectively verifiable. So you can't make representations that are not true. Uh, Florida has a non-solicitation rule. So if someone's in an accident, an attorney can't be in the waiting room of a doctor's office or of the hospital trying to get that client. If you write letters, there's time frames for an attorney to send out letters to people that have received traffic tickets and things like that. So it's heavily regulated to a point, but then there's also the First Amendment which says attorneys have the right to free speech. So it's a fine line what we can regulate versus what we're not allowed to regulate by you know, the U.S. Constitution. All right, and th these attorneys, I, I assume if they're violating these rules, you have some remedial um, education that you can do. Is there an advertising workshop, I think? Yes, there is. Actually, in the state of Florida, we have a separate grievance committee that hears all advertising complaints for the whole state. They do not go to a local grievance committee, and um, they do send them, the majority of them, if it's just a minor thing like Scott was talking about, not understanding the rules, they'll be sent to our advertising um, workshop. Okay. Scott, one of the things that, uh, that you mentioned uh, about the Florida Bar being the, uh, the agency that, and the Supreme Court that regulates attorneys, let's contrast that with how other professions are regulated. How would a doctor or a contractor, or uh, what would happen if they were accused of violating their professional ethics? If they're accused, and I'm not an expert in each of their fields, but the Department of Business and Professional Regulation handles, let's say, contractors or, or other businesses, that's a government entity, that's taxpayer money. The, the government establishes administrative organizations that monitor them and they will have either complaints and hearings and, and they will be handled by the governmental agency. Doctors have the Agency for Healthcare Administration, I believe, and they have to go through that procedure. We're one of the few professions I know that do this self-regulation that I talked about under the Florida Supreme Court. Sheila, what happens to an attorney who commits um, minor infractions of the code, but repeatedly? How is that person treated uh, by the bar in this process? I mean, they made a mistake, maybe it was minor, another year comes by, they do something else. How do you handle those cases? Okay. 
usually what happens is if an attorney continues in the same conduct, say the first time the grievance committee saw them and they gave them that letter of advice that um, Scott told us about. Next time they see them again a year later, they're doing the same thing, becoming concerned. So maybe we send them now to the diversionary program to ethics school so they can take a refresher course on all the rules. If they come back again, they're probably going to end up with that minor misconduct. Um, usually the court has said once you commit misconduct, it builds the next time. So as soon as they get something that's going to be public, that would definitely build on them until they're suspended or disbarred. Okay. Well, I think we're, we're coming here close to the end of uh, this presentation. And let me just ask you folks, uh, I'll start with you, Sheila. What would you like the people to know that watch this program um, about the bar process? Well, I'd like them to know that the bar really does care about protecting the public and giving them information. One of the reasons why our website has so much information um, and that we do take very seriously our bar counsel um, investigating and prosecuting cases if they need be to be done. How about you, Scott? What would you like them to know? I, mean, I would agree with Sheila. The, the bar has very serious regulations. Attorneys are held to a very high standard, and we do take any violation very seriously. We are here to protect the public, and we're also here to help our members and educate them. Most of the stuff you read in the paper is a very, very small percentage. If you have 100,000 attorneys you're talking about, 5% of those, of, you have what 5,600 complaints that are filed, and some of those are against the same attorney. So you have less than 5% of our members based on those numbers that even have a complaint filed. So we take it seriously, uh, we deal with it very seriously, and we want to make sure the public is protected, and we're teaching attorneys to do things the right way. All right. Well, I'd like to thank both of you for coming in and do this. Um, this is all the time we have today. The process we've discussed protects attorneys from unfounded, malicious allegations that could unjustifi unjustifiably ruin their reputations and practice while providing an effective way to remove from the profession the worst type of lawyer whose conduct stains the reputation of the great majority of ethical attorneys who form the Florida Bar. So we appreciate the bar, uh, the, the bar coming forward to help us. Scott, thank you for your help. Thank you. And uh, we hope the viewers have gained some insight into this important area of lawyer regulation. This is Lee Hayworth. Thank you for watching. Thank you.